day before the race, Sunday, May 1st, and I'm just kind of getting my drop bags together, getting ready to head down to registration to get my bib and everything. But we'll just kind of kind of show you what I'm packing here. And I'm kind of winging this, to be honest, just because I've never done a race of this magnitude. So I have six drop bags. Um, two of them are going to different locations. So this first one is going to Skull Valley, and then they're shipping it off to Walnut Canyon. Same thing for this one. It's going to White Rock first and then Fort Todd Hill. But essentially, I have one for Skull Valley, Whiskey Row, Mingus, uh, Sedona, Munns Park, and Todd Hill. And in each of these, I mostly just have clothing options. Uh, long sleeve, short sleeve, pants, gloves, whatever I need. Um, depending on what time I'm expected to be there. And just an assortment of snacks. Uh, which basically consists of like applesauce packets, fruit snacks, uh, Oreos, chips, gels, um, you know, all the good stuff. So I'm not sure how much I'm going to utilize all this, but it's nice to have um, just in case something comes up and, you know, for whatever reason, they don't have whatever I need at the aid station. I at least know I have something in my drop bags, but I am going to use the aid station food a lot because there's going to be a lot of real food on the menu. Um, there's 21 aid stations in total, and a lot of them are going to have real food, so I'm looking forward to that. And I also have crew for this race. Uh, so my mom's here all week, and then my girlfriend's going to be helping out as well. So really thankful for them, which I've never had a race with this kind of support before, so it's kind of awesome. But I'm hoping that if I do need something that I don't have, you know, I can just call them and have them meet me at the next aid station and, and pick up whatever I need. So I actually didn't pack as much as I thought I would in these drop bags, but I wanted to have something again, just in case unforeseen circumstances, you know, I at least know I have something there. Plus it's nice to have something to just look forward to when you're out there for these crazy long distances, you know, you know that you have a drop bag at the aid station. So sometimes that can like perk you up. So that's that. Uh, I have three Kogala batteries, two of the big ones and one of the small one for my Kogala light. I'm going to use these to charge my phone and headphones and my watch and everything else as well because they have three USB ports. So one of these is basically just a backup. So I'm only going to carry this one on me. These two I'll probably have with my crew. And again, if I need them, they can drop them off. I also have a Petzl headlamp just in case just as a backup, but my Kogala light's gonna get me through the night on my naked belt, which this is a great setup for it. I just have it, I have the magnet strip and the Velcro wrapped around to hold the light in place. And then the battery pack just goes in, in the pouch on the back. So it's really a good setup. Doesn't bounce or chafe or anything. My Solomon Advanced Skin 12 with my uh, hiking poles, my little quiver on the back. Um, this is going to be filled up with, uh, gosh, I have to get this all together still, but basically just different clothing options. Um, I have a liter and a half bladder on the back, two soft flasks up front. So that's about a two and a half liter capacity, which is fine. Um, the course did get rerouted a little bit. Well, a lot, unfortunately, due to the Crooks fire here in Prescott. So that big 22 mile stretch. Um, up to Lane Mountain in the start of the course is not there anymore. So um, so we have uh, more or less time in between aid stations now. So they're not requiring that three or four liter capacity for the start of the race that they were last year. So this will be just fine. Um, so I'll get this filled up with all my lights and chargers and clothes and everything at some point. But as for now, we're about to head down to the... Uh, the registration and I'll get my bib and I'll get my merch and all that good stuff. And oh, I'll show you guys, guys this real quick too. So this is kind of my pace chart. My girlfriend made this for me cause she's awesome. But these are all the aid stations, the miles, my expected section time, my aid station time, my pace that I need to hit and my time expected time of arrival along with the cutoff time. So this is super cool. I'm going to have this on me at all times just to make sure I'm keeping a good pace. So right now I'm projected to finish Friday at a little before 8 p.m., um, which would put me well in front of the cutoff, which is Saturday at noon. So hopefully I can stick to that, but you know, anything can happen. 
at a race like this. I've never done anything more than 100 miles or so. This is uh, completely new to me. But we're gonna head down to the uh, expo and we'll check in then. What's up guys? Um, so before we get into the video, it's a few days after the race now. It's uh, May 10th, I think. So we finished on, on Saturday. So been uh, recovering here for the last couple of days and just been going through um, the footage I got from the race and I got some really cool stuff. So I'm excited to put it all together. But I thought before we got into the actual race footage that we would go over um, kind of some more of my drop bags and my crew and the role that they played because it was such an advantage having them there. So in the previous video, I kind of went through the six drop bags I had uh, throughout the course. I pretty much didn't use any of them because I had a crew. So it was nice to have just in case, but my crew, which was my mom and my girlfriend, Emily, who was also a pacer towards the end, uh, we kind of had this bin all set up with basically all the snacks that I would have had in my drop bags, just kind of all in one location. So we had Lay's potato chips, fruit snacks, some beef jerky, some fig bars, Quest bars, which I didn't eat any of. Um, usually you don't want a whole lot of protein type stuff uh, with events like these, but I figured, you know, just in case it'd be good to have, but I didn't use them. Um, Tailwind, Golden Stuff Oreos, uh, and then we had our Honey Stinger Gels. I used these a lot, these little squeezable applesauce packets. Um, these are great because, like, further into a long race like this you go, sometimes it gets hard to, like, like chew and swallow, so... I ended up using a ton of these. These are like 70 calories a pack. So I was going to squeeze a couple of them. Uh, payday bars. These are really good because they don't melt like most chocolate bars do. Since these are just peanut and caramel, uh, you know, no matter how hot it is, they won't melt. And it's a great way to get some sodium and some protein and some calories. Um, so I think that was it as far as snacks go. But we also had like... My foam rollers, some sunscreen, salt tablets, KT tape, my Happy Toes, nut butter, uh, Tums just in case, more nut butter, um, kind of everything that we might need. Um, brought a Rubik's Cube just in case, like, um, I don't know, I need to lift my spirits at an aid station or something. I don't think I actually used it at all during the race, but something funny to have. For those that know me. Um, so that was what we had packed for my crew. And then we also got this armchair. Uh, so it was really nice to go into an aid station and to have the chair set up. To have basically everything I need right there. And just be able to be like, hey, I need my water bottle filled. Or I need my, my bladder topped off. Or, you know. And you can just kind of sit and relax and have them, and have them take care of you. Uh, I've never had that in a race before. But having done it now i couldn't imagine doing a race like this without a crew like there's people that do it and props to those guys but i couldn't imagine it uh they helped so much so if i do end up doing a 200 mile race again um for sure gonna have a crew because then it just makes it more fun too because you can share it with people so let's talk about the expo so we went down to the start line on sunday and we got our swag bag which was this coca dona uh, book bag that you can use as a drop bag or whatever, but all of our goodies were in here. So the big thing we got was this Coca Dona sun hoodie. This is a, it's a 50 SPF sun hoodie. I used it during the race. It's kind of worn as you can tell. I haven't washed it yet. I was about to do laundry, but, um, it's super comfortable. I use this a lot. I had this on most of the days, two, three, and four, I think. Um, so yeah, that's a really cool item that we got. They gave us two race bibs, uh, one as a keepsake and one to wear. So this, this is the one that I wore <laughs> during the race. Uh, and they gave us this race belt too that we could have clipped on us because like, you know, you change clothes so many times instead of pinning it on, you can just race belt it on. So that was cool. But <laughs> that's the, the war torn race bib. And then this right here is the fresh race pip. So it gets pretty gnarly out there. So I'm glad they gave us two. They put our home state there in the corner, which is nice. Um, so I'll probably be hanging that up or doing something with it. 
Boy, maybe I should hang this one up because that kind of shows you what you <laughs> what you went through. It's pretty insane how battered that got. Um, so that's that. And since we're here, uh, spoiler alert, I did finish. So this is the buckle that we got for finishing the Kukadona 250. It's made of copper. Copper that's actually mined in the mountains that we traverse here in Arizona. So and it's really detailed and, and pretty. So it's got the state flag in the middle. It's got red rock here. It's kind of got the pine trees and mountains up here. Some saguaros down there. So kind of like the more you look at it, the more detail you see. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and that goes right up here next to my other buckles and other stuff I have on my desk. <laughs> so that's that. Um, and then we also got like some samples of gnarly and like some coffee samples and some coupons to local restaurants and that sort of thing in our swag bag. Uh, so I just wanted to cover that cause I didn't really get any footage when I was there. Um, so with that, I'll also show you this. So I did finish the race, but as you'll see in the video, uh, my ankle started feeling not good, you know, maybe about a hundred or so miles into the race. So I actually got an x-ray today and I am in a boot for a month because I have stress fractures in my foot and ankle. So uh, it was a struggle to finish for sure because of that. I was in a lot of pain, but I knew like, I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to quit. You know, it wasn't an option. So I was going to cross the finish line no matter what. And even my, my right foot's still kind of swollen um, in my recovery shoes here, but the left one's just jacked. So Nothing for four weeks, and then they're going to look at it again and, and go from there. But I think that's about all I wanted to cover as far as the pre-video goes. So without further ado, we'll get into the actual race footage here at the start line. Two and a half miles here into the Coconut 250. So what's that, like 1% of the way done? Uh, a little bit of a cluster at the start. I kind of got caught in the back of the pack. Um, I kind of, I saw my friends up ahead in the trail, so I made a little push to catch up to them. So I'm running with Amy and Carol, who are behind me. Some local runners are on the single track on the Prescott Circle Trail. And at about mile five, we're gonna be running past Noel Kingston's house, who's a um, part-time air bike employee, but also one of the leaders of the Prescott Area Trail Runners group. So looking forward to seeing some of my friends there. Check back in then. Oh, oh sweet. So we're approaching Noel's house here. Almost at the address. And here we have local guys, Holly and Jeff, El Frico and Turbo, Cocodona finishers last year. Thanks for being out here, guys. These guys are doing rim to rim to rim, alternate, plus the regular, and one big loop later this week. They're doing South Bass, River Hitching, up North Bass, running to North Kaibab, going back up South Kaibab. They're gnarly. You don't want a picture? No, but I do want a picture of the signs. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's not the Black Canyon Trail, like the original course, but we're getting some really nice runnable single track here on the Prescott Circle Trail on the rerouted course. We just had a really pretty overlook where you could see Mingus, Prescott Valley, um, and you could see the San Francisco Peaks behind that. 
so you can kind of see the rest of the course already at mile almost 7.75 so almost eight miles in you kind of have the rest of the course mapped out in front of you already which is crazy over here i uh, can't really see it anymore but fun butte it's kind of a local landmark here in prescott we're going to be going around that before linking up back with the original course at around mile 58 or so i think but that'll be after we head back or after we head down to Skull Valley, head back up to Prescott and go around Thumb Butte. So it's kind of cool being on the single track trail. We've climbed a little bit, but you can just kind of see where you're going over the next, you know, 240 miles or so. It's pretty cool. It's a beautiful day so far. Uh, high 70s, slight breeze, not much of a breeze right now. Um, but you know, this trail's pretty exposed as far as lack of shade. So it's nice that the temperatures aren't too hot. The high in Phoenix today is 97. So if we were doing that lane mountain climb, you know, it'd be just like last year, just as gnarly as far as the heat goes, which I'm kind of bummed we're not doing it. Um, here if I put, put on a training run about a month ago where we did the first 37 miles of the course, start to crown king. So I, I was a part of that. So I at least got to experience it. And uh, it's just super gnarly. You hit that mile 11 aid station, the Cottonwood Creek, and then it's just a grind for 22 miles. Super exposed, no water, just crazy terrain. I mean, that section for sure lives up the, to the hype. Um, so we are getting a little bit of an easier version this year in that regard, but still 250 miles is 250 miles. Um, but yeah, just enjoying the day so far. Really happy to be out here. Kind of surreal that I'm doing this and not watching the live stream. And it's even weirder cause like I've run these trails, like I've run this trail. I've been down that way, I've been up this way. Like these are just kind of my home trails that I'm doing, which is cool. Uh, kind of calling this race the Prescott Dona, since we're kind of getting a tour of Prescott. Um, so different than, than last year for sure, but still a great experience to be out here. And hoping that uh, so for a good week, I want to finish Friday before sunset, which would be around 106 hours, I think. But with a cutoff of 122 hours, if I finish in 121 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds, I'll be just as thrilled. So anyway, we're plugging away. We got about three miles till the first aid station. So maybe, uh, We'll check in then. I feel like I just turned the camera off, but I'll show you guys this too. So, whoop. this is Granite Mountain. Kind of an iconic mountain here in Prescott, in central Arizona. So the Granite Mountain Hotshots, if you guys are familiar with those, the 19 firefighters who lost their lives fighting the Yarnell Fire, that's the mountain that they're named after. If you watch the movie Only the Brave, it's about those firefighters. It's a great movie. But there it is. And if you're ever in Prescott, highly recommend doing the hike up to the top of Granite because the views up there are just epic. There's also some great loops to run around Granite Mountain. So there's the Little Granite Mountain Loop and the Baby Granite Mountain Loop where you can combine those loops and just kind of create your own adventure. So but there it is, Granite Mountain. Beautiful. Rolling into the first aid station here at Iron Springs, mile 11. This is where we have our group runs on Tuesdays, which is super weird and super cool. But now we're doing Coca Dona instead. 
So we're gonna fuel up here and keep going. So we're back here out on the trail, more single track. Beautiful single track around Prescott. Pretty runnable section right now, but anyway. So my girlfriend made this for me because she's awesome. I'll try to show it while I'm holding my poles in the camera, but this is my pace chart. So we just left Iron Springs, so now we're on our way to White Rock. At mile 17.9 will be there. So in this segment, I want to keep around a 1540 pace. The first segment was 1444, which I actually was quite a bit quicker than that. So my projected time to leave Iron Springs was 1 p.m. It's 1245, so a little bit ahead of schedule, which is good so far. We'll see. We'll try to stick to this as much as possible throughout the week. This has me finishing in Flagstaff Friday at 7.55, which would be right around sunset, maybe a little after, which would be ideal. I, I definitely don't want to spend another night overnight in Flagstaff where it's going to be colder. So definitely trying to finish Friday before the sun goes down. But she also printed out and laminated, whoop, this is hard to do, all the sections with the elevation charts so that was the first section start to iron springs and then on the back of this is what we're doing now iron springs to white rock so you can see it kind of a lot of rolling hills but going down for a little bit and then a climb up to the white rock aid station and emily my girlfriend and my mom will be there waiting for me so that'll be cool and until then, I'm just going to enjoy this nice runnable single track here through the Prescott National Forest. Actually, I'm not sure if we're in the National Forest boundary or not, because I know they closed it because of the fire. It might just be on the outskirts of it, but either way, we're uh, running through the pines. And it's beautiful. So I'm going to enjoy it. Approaching the second aid station at White Rock, which again is one of our usual meeting spots for our Prescott area trail running group, which is so weird. Like we just ran all these trails that I run with my friends all the time. <sighs> running some miles with my good buddy John, who's behind me a little bit. Bit 201. <sighs> and here we are coming into the aid station. Refill here a little bit and keep on going down to Skull Valley. So we're making our way from White Rock to Finch Wells Aid Station. Here's the backside of Thumb Butte. One of our local landmarks here in Prescott. A lot of hiking trails up there and a good place to watch sunset. Coming up on your right. Thanks. So that's Thumb Butte, and then we're overlooking Prescott here. Kind of see Prescott Valley off in the distance. I'm not sure how much the camera can pick up, but that mountain range that kind of tips off down to the left, that's Mingus. So that's the way up and over to Jerome. That's what we'll be taking tomorrow at some point. This is a uh, rolly section we're running downhill right now but we'll be climbing up a little bit and then we're gonna hit the Sierra Prieto overlook which is a great view got a little overlook uh, well the Sierra Prieto is not ringed um, and then you'll also see Skull Valley from up there which is where we're running down to before turning back around and coming back into Prescott but this is cool seeing the backside of Thumb Butte. Very pretty. So we're making our way up this climb to the Sierra Prieta overlook, but this is a cool spot. You can kind of see the rest of the course all mapped out. So there's Thumb Butte, 
Um, the mountain range behind me is Mingus. It's a little hazy, but you can kind of make out the peaks behind there. So, again, it's cool. We're kind of doing these miles around Prescott and you get to certain points and you can literally see like most of the rest of the course. It's really unique for a, you know, a 250 mile race to be able to see where you're going. And uh, there's points throughout the course where it'll get closer and closer. Like once we're on, on top of Mingus, we'll get another view where you can look down into Cottonwood and Sedona and you can start to see the Coconino Plateau and Flagstaff a little bit clear once you're up there, but it's, uh, it's cool. As we uh, just keep making steady progress. Another good shot of granite over there. And I'm gonna check back in more at the top of this climb, show you the Sierra Prieta overlook. Here we're almost 35 miles in, like 34.62 to be exact. Past uh, Finch Wells a little bit ago, making our way down to Skull Valley, in like two and a half more miles, maybe closer to three. I don't know. The sun's starting to set. Probably another hour or so of daylight. Um, we're on the out and back section of this course, so the leaders and all the faster guys are coming this way so saw Mike McKnight, Michael Versteeg, some other fast guys so it's pretty cool different this year with the course change to have this out and back but it's kind of neat sharing the camaraderie with the faster runners anyway still feeling good just wanted to give an update and uh, check in at Skull Valley Crossing over a cattle guard, so I'm gonna be careful. All right, getting into the first night chunk here at Cocodona. Mile 36.67. Uh, left the Skull Valley aid station a little bit ago. Hung out there for close to an hour, I feel like, maybe 45 minutes. Uh, had a burger, had some other food. Just kind of sat and relaxed for a little bit. Um, but I'm still roughly an hour ahead of schedule from what my project projected uh, time should be. So that's good. Um, yeah, I have a, a pastor friend who pastors a church in, in Phoenix that was working the aid station. So was chatting with, with him for a while. So that was, that was good catching up. Uh, so anyway, we're tackling the, the night section now and Hoping to be at Whiskey Row by like 3 a.m. <clears throat> um, and then I'm planning on sleeping there until sunlight. But that might change. So I kind of got some bad news. Uh, so I was supposed to have a pacer from Whiskey Row to Mingus Mountain. Unfortunately, uh, she got sick. So she can't do it. Um, so... The bad news is I'm not gonna have a pacer for that section. The good news is um, I could push on if I want to instead of sleeping, you know, while, cause the whole idea was to sleep until it got light out so that you know, she could meet me there in the morning and not have to leave at some crazy hour in the middle, the middle of the night. So we'll see how I feel when I get there. Um, might sleep for a little bit, but not as much as I was planning. Uh, I don't know, we'll see, but anyway. Not gonna do a whole lot of filming tonight because you can't see anything. So I will probably check in in the morning. I don't know if you can see, but we're uh, almost 58 miles into this thing. It's uh, a little after 2.30 in the morning and we're back on 
pavement for the first time really since like mile five, I think. But we're uh, almost to Whiskey Row. So right now we're on, it's kind of cool. We're, uh, so I don't know if you guys know, probably, probably don't know, but I do uh, carpentry work. So I work for a local contracting company. And uh, so right now we're on Valley Ranch Circle and I've worked on one house on the street. We're gonna make a right onto uh, Hazley Road, which I've worked on one house on that street and another house directly off of that street. <laughs> and then uh, left onto Center of Highway, left onto Goodwin, and I've you know worked on a few houses there too. So it's uh, it's kind of cool, this being a local hometown race for me, I guess. Um, we're also going to finally sync back up with the original course. I think once we turn onto either Hazley or Senator Highway. Um, and from then on, it's not the exact same course as last year because Watson Lake had to get rerouted and they added an out and back, uh, at Munns Park. And also it's, it's a different route going up Sedona, but as far as the reroute from the Crooks fire, we're finally uh, past that section, which is pretty crazy. 60 mile reroute, all because some idiots can't put out a campfire. It's just unbelievable. But uh, my legs and, and feet kind of hurt. Um, kind of developing a blister on my right foot. I was trying to take care of it at the last aid station with some nut butter, but probably gonna need popped but once I get to Whiskey Row which should be right around 3 a.m. which is right on pace with my chart um, I'm gonna sleep there planning on at least three hours and we'll leave Whiskey Row once it's daylight so I'm also looking forward my girlfriend's bringing me Chick-fil-a for breakfast which is gonna be awesome. Because Chick-fil-A has amazing breakfast. And for some reason, it's a very well kept secret. So I'll be getting a chicken burrito meal with extra salsa and a frosted sunrise, which is a secret menu item, but it's basically half uh, orange juice and half ice cream, which is their frozen yogurt mixed together. It's so good. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to getting some sleep here in a little bit, waking up to the start of a new day, and Chick-fil-A for breakfast, for sure. I'll check back into the courthouse. So we're making our way into the courthouse, finally. Making our way down Goodwin Street. We're gonna turn right onto Montezuma, which is actually Whiskey Row. And then our aid station's at the uh, Grand Highland Hotel. I don't know if you can see my face or not, probably not, so we'll just keep going this way. I'm doing my uh, Versteeg impression of running on the double yellows, but I'm gonna get over because there's a car coming up here for some reason at three in the morning. Should be a lot of, uh, Powder crew. Is he turning? I'm going. There should be a lot of a uh, patter, which is the uh, PATR Prescott Area Trail Runners at this aid station. I know a lot of my friends are working it. I'm just not sure what shifts they're doing, but looking forward to seeing some familiar faces there. Maybe you can see me now because it's lit. So. Funny story, last year at Cocodona, I worked the uh, overnight shift at Whiskey Row, and that was when the course started really slow because of the, you know, the first climb up to Lane Mountain. Um, so they were projecting runners to start arriving at like 6 p.m. So my shift was 4.45 to 1.45. And so we're working it and we're like following the live feed or whatever and 
we didn't see anybody. So the first guy we saw was Mike Versteeg. I remember him just rolling up at like 12.30. So this is after, you know, over like seven hours and 45 minutes of just waiting. But he rolls up just flying down Montezuma. You know, this Sasquatch looking dude with super short shorts and no shirt on in the middle of the night. I remember him crushing in and out burger and that's when he made his speech infamous speech about him wanting to meet the Phoenix Suns. But uh, yeah, that was me last year and here I am this year. So pretty gnarly. There's the courthouse. Thank you. There's a car coming, but I don't care. You can wait. Here's our street sign. This is Whiskey Row here in downtown Prescott. And we'll be arriving into the aid station here in just a little bit. In fact, here we go. My patter friends. What's up, Jeff? What's going on? How are you? Good. How you doing? What's up, Chris? Good. How's it going? Good, good, good. What kind of pizza you want? Hey, Paula. How are you? Oh, gosh. We got to show the signs here. There's me. It's awesome. Thanks to this guy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to eat some pizza. Um, what do we... Running down Whiskey Row here in Prescott. Just left the aid station. Got about two hours of sleep. I feel better than I did last night for sure. <clears throat> it's about 7.30 in the morning. And uh, we're gonna go run through my hometown. It's gonna be awesome. Almost to the turn off to Ruth Street. But I'm gonna make a pit stop at, the, at this Maverick. Cause I'm an idiot and I always forget how fast I warm up. So I have like sleeves and a jacket on and I'm just gonna take all that off. Which also means I have to put more sunscreen on. Which means I could buy sunscreen. So quick little pit stop. And we'll be back running. way down Rosser Street here in Prescott. This is gonna run into Highway 89, which will cross and then hop on the Piedmont Trail to go through Watson Lake and the Dells. It's another just surreal thing about having a race like this where I live. It's like last year I remember driving down the street on my way to work in the morning because we were working on a house back here. I remember seeing guys running down the street doing Cocodona and kind of honking my horn, cheering them on. It's like the fact that I'm here this year doing it doesn't even feel real to me yet. It's super weird. And then again, with the whole local thing, like, gosh, I've probably worked on like at least five houses directly off of this street. A buddy of mine lives. We're going to pass this house here in a second. One of our, uh, local runners right off of this street and uh yeah it's it's weird like it just feels like i'm out for a run in my hometown not that i'm a part of this epic race happening <clears throat> but it's cool once we get to uh p vine we're gonna take that we're gonna run the dells in the east side of watson lake because the west side which is where the, uh, the course ran last year that side's all closed off because they have it set up as a camp for the uh firefighters still fighting the crooks fire so 
that side's not quite as pretty, but it's still, it's still nice. Um, then we're gonna finish Pea Vine till it links up with Iron King, which runs into Prescott Valley, which is where I live. And then I'm gonna quite literally run by my house. So weird. So we're kind of nearing the apex of the hill of Rosser. So we'll be going downhill for a little bit until we hit Highway 89, but it's kind of wanted to point out some, land some landmarks here. So, right, I don't know if you can see those three little peaks popping up behind all the trees back there. I believe that's Kendrick in Flagstaff. Not positive, but I know it's a mountain range in Flagstaff. It's either Kendrick or uh, Bill Williams Mountain in Williams. One of those two. This mountain range that's kind of hazy back there, that's Mingus. So that's what we're running towards. That's what we're gonna be at by tonight, um, up and over on the way to Jerome. This hill kind of in front of me with the two antennas on top, that's Glassford Hill. Um, that's a trail that I run quite a bit. It's about a four mile out and back, so it's like 2.1 up, 2.1 down. About a thousand feet of climb. Uh, it's like gradual incline for a mile, then there's like six switchbacks for the second mile, and it, it gets kind of gnarly. It's a challenging hill for sure, but good views at the top, and you can go to the back side of Glassford Hill, like this side that we're seeing right now. Um, you can get a phenomenal view of both Watson and Willow Lake from up there. <clears throat> so that's one of my local trails that I frequent is the Glassford Hill Summit Trail. For anyone that follows me on Strava, that's where it is. And we'll see it from the other side as we're doing uh, Pea Vine and Iron King Trail to get into Prescott Valley. Over here to the right, past all these houses, can't see it now, so I might have to turn the camera on again. You'll be able to see Thumb Butte here in a little bit. You can see Badger Mountain, which the locals call Pea Mountain because there's a, you know, a, a P at the top of it, just like kind of white stone, this shaped into the letter P for Prescott. That's another great trail that I frequent. It's running up there and back. And then you can loop some other trails. So there's a good uh, seven to 11 mile loop, depending on what trails you take. But you can go up Pea Mountain and combine it with some other good trails in the area. There's just so many good trails in Prescott. We were talking, I was running with some friends yesterday. The one lives in Flagstaff. We were kind of comparing Prescott trails and Flagstaff trails. And you know, I haven't run a ton in Flagstaff, but I've run enough. And I'm sorry, I think just the trails in Prescott are better. Because Flagstaff has some world-class trails. Like they have Humphreys, they have Eldon, and then of course there's Buffalo Park and all that. But like they don't have the variety that Prescott does. And they don't have the really smooth, flowy, runnable single track that Prescott does with the Circle Trail. Because one of the great things about living here is like, we have so many different biomes with our trail system. It's like you can be in high desert, you can be up in the mountains at elevation, you can be around a lake, you can hit up slick rock. And it's so close together in proximity that you can even do that in one run. And it, like, it wouldn't even be that long. And maybe like, I'm trying to like put together roots in my head, but like over a 10 mile run, you could probably hit like three different biomes. <clears throat> so that's pretty awesome and unique to Prescott. And like, you can go down to Phoenix and they have better desert trails than we do, or you can go up to Flagstaff. They have better mountain trails than we do, but they don't have our diversity. This town has over 500 miles of trail and everything's just so different. And uh, it's really like, like a 
hidden gem of trail running. Because Prescott's mainly a retirement town, so a lot of older people live here. So that's another great thing about our trails is they're so uncrowded all the time. Like most of my runs, I don't see anybody out on the trails, not even hikers, but very rarely do I see runners. Um, and again, like you don't get that in Flagstaff or Phoenix or some of these other places where trail running is popular. And I feel like this area is just like a hidden gem of trail running waiting to be discovered. And I think that this race is kind of going to put Prescott on the map, specifically this year with the last minute reroute that we had to do. I mean, how many other towns could accommodate a 60 mile reroute? Like no big deal. And we still get beautiful views and beautiful trails. Like there's not many places where you can do that. So part of me is happy and hopeful that more people will kind of discover Prescott for its beauty and its trail systems and everything. But selfishly, I kind of want to just like keep it all to myself, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the other, lo other local runners here would say the same thing. But like, if you're a trail runner, it's seriously awesome to live here. And I can't state that enough. It's like a hidden mecca of trail running. And I think that as it gets more and more uh, discovered, like through this race and even through like the Whiskey Basin races, I think more kind of elite runners are going to move here and it might become like the next Flagstaff or, or Boulder, Colorado or one of those towns because like we have the trail system for it. Um, but having said all that, I like my trails quiet and uncrowded. So really just disregard what I said. It stinks here. Don't, uh, don't move here. There's nothing to do. So we just hopped on to P-Mine. I'm just kind of shuffling along here. Show you guys some more things here in Prescott. So that building right there behind, well, whatever this is running here, behind this truck now. That's a local dump here in Prescott, so I go there for work whenever we're, we have a big demo job or something to haul all our trash away. That's where we go. This concrete building right here, our local firefighters used to practice putting out fires. So a couple times a year, they'll light that building up and uh, practice putting it out. So that's kind of cool. You can see a fire truck there. So Iron King, I'm sorry, Peavine Trail, it's about a 12, maybe 13 mile trail. Uh, it's, part of it is an old rail trail from when there used to be a railroad here. So that's how they made this trail. We're going to take it until it junctions with Iron King Trail, which leads into Prescott Valley. It's pretty on the ground. I don't even know what that is. That's super cool. White powdery stuff. I feel like I should know what that is, but I have no idea. Anyway, we're on the east side of Watson Lake, as I mentioned, because the west side is, well, the whole Watson Lake Park is closed for the firefighter camp. Yep. kind of see it through the trees. If you are visiting Prescott and you have time to see one thing in town, I would probably recommend Watson Lake. You can do a loop trail around Watson Lake. It's about 4.7 miles. Uh, and again, that's a trail that I frequent a lot for anyone that follows John Strava. I run Watson Lake quite a bit. You get about two miles of kind of flat, easy terrain like this. But once you get into the rock section, which we call the granite dells, it, uh, it gets a little gnarly and technical. So you can see the dells back there. Here's Watson Lake. Now, just on the other side of the street, that way is Willow Lake, which is another 
lake or out in the granite dells here in town that's about a five mile loop um and that's a great trail too i prefer watson lake to willow but both are great um but if i had to pick one i'd go watson there's a really cool area of the watson lake loop that unfortunately we're not doing this year because of the reroute but it kind of goes behind watson lake dam and when it's full it's a really pretty waterfall there and it kind of creates this little oasis there's this little stream there's a footbridge that crosses it and it gets really lush and green down there which you wouldn't expect like you know, running through the rocks like this and then you see this green area there is also a, a willow lake dam and when that is full and overflowing that gets really pretty too uh not as green as the watson lake one but there's some really cool rock sections that the water flows down but the water levels have been pretty low in both lakes here for the past year or so uh, but anyway here we are running alongside beautiful watson lake here in prescott you can also rent kayaks take them out there you can do open water swimming so again not trying to brag on prescott because it's nice and quiet and uncrowded i shouldn't even say that in the three and a half years that i've lived here it's grown substantially uh and it's grown a lot more since before that so um but as far as like trail running goes it's uncrowded but don't move here we're full just kidding not really but it is beautiful and it's a beautiful day to be outside enjoying it so we're up in the dell section here and there's an epic view watson lake Grand Mountain in the background. You can see Thumb Butte off to the left there. Awesome up here. I have a feeling I'm going to be uh, turning this camera on quite a bit through this section. I'll show you guys how beautiful it is. There's more beautiful views of Watson Lake up here. On these trails. We're all on white dots. And they have it marked pretty well um this would be tough to do at night but they have uh like glow sticks out for that but still even as a local glad to be doing this in the daytime because there's so many winding trails back here it's very easy to get disoriented uh ran into howie stern back there the uh famous race photographer just cool we were chatting for a little bit change GoPro battery soon at 18% so I'll keep this one going for a little bit but I brought five batteries with me I'm hoping that uh, that'll be enough to capture this whole thing Which it should be I'm running on day two and still in the same original battery so you can kind of see San Francisco peaks very hazily off in the distance. You probably can't see it in the camera, but I can see it here. And Howie and I were talking about just how beautiful this whole spot is. And it's like, for me, even as a local, uh, it never gets old being on these trails, going through the Dells and having Watson Lake in the background and all the mountains around us. It's just so beautiful. Ooh, it's a little steep there. So I'm taking it pretty easy so far during this section, just because this terrain is kind of gnarly and I don't want to jack my feet up on it just because there's still a long, long, long way to go. Once we get back on the Key Vine, I'll maybe 
reshuffle for a little bit. Try to make up some time, but I'm still well within my range. And again, it's still pretty early. A lot can happen, but I'd really like to finish Friday before sunset. That'd be awesome if I could. <clears throat> um, so anyway, we're gonna keep making our way. Oop, there's a runner up ahead, cool. Keep making our way through the dells here. I think we should be nearing the end of the section, so getting back on the pea vine here shortly. And uh, yeah, we'll check in along the way to Iron King. It's a pretty neat little section of the dells right here called the Point of Rocks. I don't think there's trails to get up there, but I know that some people rock climb it, which I don't do, but anyway, we're back here on the Peavine Trail after doing that little loop through the dells on the east side of Watson Lake. There's a sign there about the railroads that used to be here in Prescott, not anymore. We should be about a half mile away, maybe a little less, to the intersection of Peavine. I think this battery's dead, but I was just saying I'm going to be credited for bonus mileage that I didn't do with my item mileage on my watch. But anyway, I'm going to change battery out when we get to the next aid station. Just left the Iron King aid station. Got a fresh battery in the GoPro. Got a nice Chick-fil-A meal with a frosted lemonade. So good. So now we're kind of on my home stretch, which I've actually been looking forward to, even though I guess this is like some people's least favorite part of the course. We're gonna be running through the field that pretty much cuts through my house and my mom and my girlfriend are gonna be waiting with my dog. So I'm really looking forward to that. You can see Mingus straight ahead. That's where we're going up and over to Jerome. It's about 12, 13. My, uh, my watch got screwed up somehow as far as the mileage. So I'm actually, it says I'm at like 80.6. But I'm actually at like 74.5. So I think I talked about that in the uh, in the last video. So I'm getting like six bonus miles somehow. Uh, but anyway, um, this is all new development here. I guess they're putting in more houses. But at some point we're gonna get to a field and we're gonna, they call it cross country through the field so you basically it's not there's no trail or anything you just kind of go straight one direction for a mile and a half that actually might be this to start with not sure but uh, either way I said I was gonna show you guys Glassford Hill so that's Glassford Hill from the front um, and that's a trail that, like I said, I, I run quite a bit. It's kind of a, I guess it's like one of the big landmarks here in Peavy. It was an old volcano that erupted, so you can kind of see the lava in the middle of it. I don't know if you can see it or not. Um, what else is I gonna say? Don't remember. So I'm gonna sign off. I'll probably uh, turn this back on when uh, I meet up with my dog, Sadie, because that's going to be awesome. So we're making our way through this field in between the, uh, the Iron King and Fane Ranch aid stations. Some cows over there. My house is right there, right behind those cows, one of the streets. 
where I live. <laughs> so, like, one of the reasons why I thought it'd be cool to do this race is because I remember last year walking my dog around the block and, and like, watching Cocodona runners. And it was just, like, super inspiring and, like, super cool to think that there's this epic race happening and, like, I live right there. <laughs> so, again, it's weird for me to be out here actually doing it this year. Like, it still doesn't feel real. Uh, for some reason, I don't know. But, the idea seemed really cool to be able to like look at my house and still have, you know, 150 miles to go. Now that I'm out here doing it, uh, it's still cool, but like, it's like, dang, my couch, my bed, my dog, shower, like a warm shower, like everything I know that's familiar and comfortable is right there. But we're doing a lot of miles that way instead. And I won't be home for another four days probably. <laughs> so, yeah, it's wild. cool that the cows are out. Um, they rotate between a few different fields here, but I, I love seeing animals. Like, when you drive around Prescott, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, like, we have cattle, we have antelope, we have pronghorn. Um, if you go up into the woods, you see a lot of deer, so I don't know why, it just always makes me happy to see wildlife. Even though cattle aren't technically wildlife, I still I think any living creature is wildlife, whether it's domesticated or not. So this is the local wildlife here, <laughs> through my field, right by my house. Anyway, I feel like I'm having a moment right now. <clears throat> and this guy's looking at me. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep, plugging away here. I'm not gonna go home. I'm gonna go that way. Up and over Mingus. But uh looking forward to seeing my dog here in a couple minutes. <laughs> I'm filming this. Sadie! Doggy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice moment. Yeah. Alright, I think that's enough. <laughs> so this is our trail. Currently crossing on our 89A, I think. 
kind of spooky. The ceiling's really low. <sighs> like maybe a six foot clearance. Sweet. More open fields. So there's these barbed wire fences around here. And they have these A-frame just wooden ladders. build them tall enough <laughs> so the, the top rung the barbed wire still sticks up a couple of inches so you kind of have to like climb up here Adderholt, the race director, was telling us about that at the race briefing yesterday. Not yesterday, I was running yesterday. Uh, what, two days ago? Uh, so yeah, we were all kind of getting a laugh out of it. So we're still making our way towards Mingus. Should be at the Fane Ranch Aid Station in a mile or two. And then, uh, yeah, then a big climb. coming into the last aid station at Fane Ranch. Um, after, <laughs> after hanging out with my dog, which was like one of the highlights of the race so far, uh, there were just like two or three more open fields we had to make our way across. And I don't know, like something about it just being so exposed and it being hot started to get to me. Uh, so got to the aid station, laid down for about 10 minutes. I don't think I actually fell asleep at all, but it felt good to lay down. I might have fallen asleep for a few minutes. If I did, it wasn't like great sleep, but uh, anyway. And then I had uh, my foam roller there, trying to work out some kinks. Ate a bunch of sweet food. It's usually when you're tired, it's from what I've experienced, it's because your blood sugar is too low. So I think uh, at the uh, Iron King aid station, I had too much salty, not enough sweet. So this aid station, I basically just had all sweet food. And uh, yeah, I'm really not looking forward to doing this climb right now. But Mingus is getting closer and closer. Um, yeah, I'm just being a little bit wimp about it. I've done this climb like probably 50 times. So once we actually get on the trail, I think it'll be better because it'll be a little more shaded. Uh, yeah, but this, this last section's kind of a drag. I can see, honestly, like I, I can see why people were saying like, the Prescott Valley section is their least favorite part. It's like some parts of it are cool, but a lot of it you're just kind of, it's just not too exciting. Um, but it's pretty much the only way to get to Mingus is to go through all this. So it's still good. Anyway. I got the sun hoodie out, so this was the uh, in our swag bag for Coca Donut. It's pretty sweet. It's got the Air Viper logo on the sleeve down here. It's got the Coca Donut logo. It's super lightweight and breathable. It's like SPF 50 material. <clears throat> so I'm giving it a shot. I usually uh, never understood people that wear this stuff when it's hot out because when it's hot out, I usually like to have like 
tank top on. But, uh, yeah, the sun felt like it was starting to beat me down. So, giving this a shot, see how it feels. Plus, once we get on the trails to climb up Mingus, like I said, it'll be a little more shaded. And it'll be cooler up there, too. So, I feel like this will be more comfortable anyway. Plan is to get to the top of Mingus before dark. So, I've got, well, I've got plenty of time. It's 2.48. This is a 12 mile section. <clears throat> um, so that should be, should be doable. So we're gonna keep chipping away. Kind of making the death march up this service road here. Nice shot of a uh, Fresca and PV. Back there you can make out Glassford Hill, probably not in the camera, but Bradshaw Mountains, where we would have come from if it weren't for the Crooks Fire. That's the mountain range directly behind me, which is still going on. Last I checked, it was like 70% contained, so it's definitely a lot better. This time last week, this whole area was so crazy smoky like i've never seen this town like that but i guess the winds shifted enough to where we've got blue skies again and uh got a good shot of mingus here so there's these two mountains right here we call this whole area mingus um, technically, these are called the Black Hills, but the locals just call this whole area Mingus. So, Mingus Mountain is actually the one on the right. The mountain on the left is called Woodshoot Mountain, and it's actually, I think, 200 or so feet taller than Mingus Mountain. Two or 300 feet, I'm not sure the exact number, but it is taller than Mingus. Yeah, even though we just call the whole area Mingus. So we're climbing up Mingus Mountain. Uh, we're taking trail 28 all the way to the top. There's a loop you can do called the Jaeger Canyon Loop Trail where you take 28, not to the very top. Um, there's a spot where it forks at like 1.85 miles. So we're gonna fork to the left, but if you stay to the right of the fork, you'll hop on trail 111 you can take that to a dirt road that you turn right on just for like two tenths of a mile, three tenths of a mile. Then you hop on trail 531. That takes you down the mountain to complete the loop. So it's about a 6.2 mile loop. It's about 1400 feet of climb. It's my favorite loop in the area. I do it. I try to do it once a week. I haven't been getting up there as much lately, but for anyone that follows me on Strava, um, hey, cows over there. Um, for anyone that follows me on Strava, whenever I do the, the Jaeger Canyon loop, that's the trail that I'm doing up and down Mingus. There's some great trails on the top of Woodshoot. Um, there's the Woodshoot 102 trail. And the cool thing about that is it actually starts at the top of the mountain. So you drive, there's a dirt road that'll take you all the way to the top. Um, and you can either make a right or a left. So you make a left when you're at the top and the chair heads back that way, but you get views like instantly. So without, without having to climb, you're rewarded with great views right away. And it's beautiful because on that trail, it's on the ridge line of the mountain. So you look to your left, you can see Prescott, Prescott Valley. You look to your right, you can see Verde Valley, Sedona, Flagstaff. And you could use like that just the whole way. It's really pretty. Um, and there's good, there's good spots up there to watch sunset on both Woodshoot and Mingus. The Jaeger Loop's a great one for sunset because if you start at the right time, 
when you come down the 533, which I think I might have said 531 earlier. It's it's 28, 111, 533 is the loop. But if, if you time it right, you come down the 533 at sunset and it sets just right behind Prescott. And it's gorgeous. It just lights up the whole sky. Gold and all sorts of pretty sunset colors. But anyway, I'm looking forward to actually getting on the mountain because I know this climb really well, like the back of my hand. Uh, so I think the climb won't be too bad. So we'll check in when we're there. Well, we made it to the overlook, almost at the top of Mingus. So from the trailhead, this spot's like 1.66 miles. So we got about another two tenths to get to uh, the top part of the works at 1.85. But I always stop here, so even though I'm in the middle of Cookie Donut, I'm gonna stop here and enjoy this view because it's awesome. You can see all of Prescott Valley, Bradshaw Mountains, Glassford Hill. Kind of see my housing development, but there's no way the camera can pick that up. But. Anyway, if any of you guys watched my uh, my why I signed up for Coca Dona video, I went to the spot here in that video as well. So same spot, same trail. Uh, I don't want to stay for too long because we're almost at the end of the climb. So like I said, we got an, an, uh, about another two tenths. Um, then it flattens out for a little bit, and then. It'll fork off to the left, which we'll take to climb a little bit more. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred feet, over a half mile. And then we'll hit dirt roads and pretty soon we'll be at Mingus Camp, but pretty cool. So on fresh legs, from the trailhead to that spot, I can do it in about 25 minutes. This took like probably double that, like 45, 50, moving slow. But I have like 90 miles under me at this point, so it is what it is. But it's like on fresh legs, I run up most of that. Usually I can't run up all of it, but I'll at least run up like the first 1.25 miles or one and a half miles. Now, I can't even imagine running up that at all. So, anyway, I'm gonna turn the camera off and we'll check in at Mingus Camp. So off to my right, there's Mingus Lake, which is more of a pond than a lake, quite honestly, but it's actually fuller than it was the last time I saw it. But anyway, Mingus Lake means we're close to Mingus Camp. Still not sure what I'm gonna do yet. It's 6.53, I was projected to get into Mingus Camp at seven, so pretty much right on schedule. But I had a huge sleep block planned out. I don't know if I want to sleep that much. Like, I might sleep for an hour or two and then head out at, like, 10, 11 o'clock, maybe midnight. That's still a long time to sleep, though. I don't, I don't know. But they have showers there, so I'm probably going to take a shower. They're serving us lasagna at the aid station food, so definitely beating some of that. Um... But yeah, I might just do a couple of hours and maybe take off around 11 o'clock or midnight to head down to Jerome. I'm not sure. I'm also picking up uh, my one of my pacers there, Harley, who amazingly has agreed to pace me for over 100 miles, even though he's, I think his biggest run is a 91K, so about 56 miles. But he's a rad dude. He's, he's a beast. He likes punishing himself, so it'll be fun to share. A large chunk of this race with him but uh yeah just wanted to show you guys the lake and we'll check in at camp uh,
This is Mingus Camp. It's pretty awesome. I'm gonna eat. So we're on the move again, left uh, Mingus camp a little bit ago. We're on the top of Mingus at the hang gliding section. So people jump off this thing and fly into... How far can they go from here? Like, uh, I don't know, pretty far. I'm assuming, I've heard stories about people getting to New Mexico, but I don't know if that's true. That's crazy. Yeah. But it's beautiful, stars are out and we can see all the lights of Camp Verde. With my buddy Harley, he's gonna be pacing me for a while. And we're going to keep moving. Day three of Cocodona. Sun's starting to come up over the Verde Valley. It's technically my first sunrise of the course. Because it started at 10 a.m. on Monday and then I was sleeping on Tuesday. Got up at about like 6 or so. So the sun's already up by then. But it's really pretty. We've been making our way down this long, rocky descent into Jerome. Feels like it's going on forever, but we only have, I think, three miles to go. And I'm feeling tired, but we're going to keep pushing. That's the Jerome Historical Society. Oh, sweet. Or school, maybe. So we got the Jerome ghost town over here on our right. They give tours down there. Uh, we came down this crazy hill. Actually, you can't see it. There was an old mine shaft dug up and the landscape was all like sandy for a little bit. It was pretty cool. So Harley, what'd you think about that night section? It was fun, uh, a lot of rocks. So many rocks. Real rocky, real rocky. So at one point we stopped for a snack and then we both turned our lights off and looked up and like Milky Way was clearly visible. Yeah, shooting stars. And yeah, and then we saw like shooting stars and a comet burned through the atmosphere. It's like pretty gnarly. So we're almost to Jerome, I think two or so miles away to the next aid station. So we're gonna keep pushing. Just made it to Jerome. We're walking through town now. Just checking out all the different stores here. My buddy Harley's opening up a Cornish Patsy restaurant up there. So if anyone's watching is in Jerome, be a good place to eat. But it's a cool little ghost town. They have uh well, it's kind of a tourist trap to be honest, but there's some cool <laughs> stuff to see and do here. <laughs> These are our street signs. Harley, what can you tell the people about Jerome? Uh, it was a mining boom town in the 1800s and 1900s. Used to have 200,000 people that lived up on the hills in tents. Um, a couple of fires ripped through, became an abandoned ghost town, and then the hippies came in the 60s and 70s and took it over and it became kind of artsy and now it's a forest trap. <laughs> it's pretty cool though. There's a gel down here they call sliding gel that moves down the hill every year, farther and farther. Really? Yeah, it's right there. Where is it? Right there. That's the sliding gel right there. I think they finally oh, cool. eventually stopped it. They put stuff to keep it from sliding. But... <laughs> so we're just coming out of the Jerome aid station and we're walking by Maynard James Keenan's house. What a tool. Ha. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> <laughs> 
aid station was back that way, past all the mining equipment. So we got a big descent here into uh, Dead Horse, mostly on pavement. My left ankle is totally not swollen at all. It's perfectly fine. Yep. It's great. Not swollen at all. Not at all. It's perfect. Stay hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you read the course chart and the elevation profile, as you see, it's an eight and a half mile stretch from Jerome to Dead Horse all downhill. You think, yeah, it's a fast section. Dude, this terrain is like worse than the descent down Mingus. I mean, it's just crazy. I don't know if you can tell how steep it is from the video, but just trust me, this is really steep, loose rock, hard to catch your footing. So yeah, my pace is going to be a little thrown off with what we projected for this section because of this terrain. But I think we're nearing the bottom. I see runners taking off down a dirt road down there, so I'm gonna catch up to Harley. So we're making our way into Clarkdale, running down this neighborhood. Just noticed this awesome cactus plant here, which is in bloom. It's really pretty. So just wanted to have that on video. Now we're gonna run some more. We've made it to the Verde River. Now the question is, do we take our shoes off and cross or just go for it? I'm thinking just go for it because it's already starting to warm up and things will dry out pretty quickly. Oh yeah. I know. I have another pair of shoes. I'm just gonna go for it. I think. Well, is it like it's not rocky under here underneath, or is it? It's just like sandy. I wanna at least fold my gaiters up because they won't dry out as quickly. How deep is it? Looks like that about knee deep. Oh really? In the dead center. Yeah, oh, then. Well, what about right here? Judging by that uh, last person that we just did. Whatever, I'm just keeping them on. Yeah? We'll dry out. What up, guys? That's a smart move. That is a smart move. Oh, wow. That's coming prepared. Oh this, yeah? You did this last year? It's, nope. No. This isn't your first go around, is it? I just don't want to have to retape anything. Right. Oh, Woo. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's about knee deep right here. I think so. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> that was fun. That plastic bag ID is genius. Look at it that. Is. It is. It's so smart. <laughs> so I don't know how well you can make it out in the camera, but off to our left is Tutsagut. National Monument. You can see people climbing up there. Some guys are on the top. Old ruins from like the 1100s, I think. Something like that. Pretty old. But it's pretty crazy. Like rounding a corner, we're like in kind of a little shaded area, and you just see these crazy ruins up on the hill. Kind of a weird moment. But what else did you expect at the Cocodona 250? Just an update here, we're a little under 120 miles in. Harley, how far are you in? Uh, about 30. 30? Yeah. 
27. That dude's the man. So we're a little bit less than halfway for the whole 250. We'll be hitting that junction here in a little bit. Right now we're on what's called the Raptor Trail. It's pretty neat. We've been kind of watching the landscape change color from dark brown to light brown to white. If you look behind us, you can see the J on the mountain in Jerome. You can see the whole town of Jerome. Where we came down to the left of that, if you can make it out, are those two towers. That's where the hang gliding station was at the top of Mingus. So we basically worked our way down that entire mountain ridge, then down and through Jerome and across the Verde to go through Clarkdale. So it's been pretty fun. Looking forward to getting up into Sedona and seeing some red rock. We should be there hopefully before dark. And then we'll kind of play it by ears to whether we want to keep pushing or sleep for a little bit. Um, so yeah, feeling strong. Harley, you feeling strong? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Yeah, we're we're going to keep rocking. I'm actually pretty surprised at how strong you're feeling after 120. So. Well, this dude's been awake for ride, over 24 hours, right? <laughs> yeah. Because he didn't really sleep last night. So uh -huh. we're... It's been fun. Yeah, it's I'm been awesome. I'm excited about to see the rest of it. <laughs> no, you're fine. You can go. Officially at the halfway point, 125-ish miles in. Still making our way to... Where are we going? Deer Pass? Uh, Deer Pass, yeah. You can start to see uh, Sedona over there past Harley, which is where we're going. Uh, warmed up quite a bit today. The sun's definitely out. Feels good, but it's still hot, so we just stopped and took a little bit, a little bit of a break in the shade. Got some lube on the feet. Tried to prevent blisters and that sort of thing, but we got about five to go to the next aid four or five, something like that. I'm looking forward to getting to Sedona before dark. Well, it isn't always all fun and games here at Cocodona. Definitely fighting through a low point for the past mile or two. Uh, my feet are just wrecked. And I've been keeping them lubed up and we even stopped and reapplied nut butter. Like, I don't know, five miles ago, but my right foot feels like it's raw in some places. And <clears throat> just trying to push through to get to the Deer Park aid station, which we're less than a mile away, so we're almost there, but this has uh, been a struggle for the last little bit. But I've been trying to remind myself of what Carrie Ward said to West Plate in his Cocodona video when he was going through a low point. It was essentially something along the lines of like how bad you feel right now something that you've earned and you can only get to this point by doing something ridiculously difficult <clears throat> and this is what you paid for like I paid money to be in this position right now. So you just accept it, embrace it, move past it, which is what I'm trying to do. And thankfully the aid station isn't too far away. I can uh, get my feet taken care of, get hydrated, get some calories in me. Maybe, uh, rest up a little bit before the climb up to Sedona. So hopefully we'll be at the aid station soon. So we're finally back on the trail. I just left the Deer Pass aid station on the way to the Sedona aid station. Hung out there for probably close to an hour, maybe a little bit more. Um, Harley's 
girlfriend met us there, Monet, who she's a nurse and she was taking care of my feet, which was awesome. Had a little Epsom salt soak, some blister care. And then I had this weird like bump on my right foot that I've had since Monday morning. And I thought it was just a blister. So I've been like keeping it taped, but I guess there was something in there, like this little black needle. So she got that out, which was cool. And we got some food, feeling a little bit better. We've got a 14.4 mile, I think, trip to the next aid station. And there's a couple of big climbs in there. So we'll probably get in like 10 or 11 PM, uh, sleep for a little bit and then head back out in the middle of the night sometime. Harley, how you feeling? Feeling pretty good, still a little tired, that's about it. Maybe catch some shooting stars tonight. Oh yeah, that'd be sick. You still feeling like you're gonna puke? Yeah, I ate a lot. Awesome. <laughs> good time. Way too much. Anyway, we're still out here plugging away. See him? Come up the hill, there's some, some right. stalking right over here. So right now there's currently a herd of deer chasing a pack of javelina. We just saw a bunch run across the trail. Are we going this way, Harley? I think so. The javelina went off this way. Wait, there's one. Oh, a little baby. Yeah, a little baby javelina. Dude. <laughs> cool. Super cool. I've never seen javelina chase deer like that. Hey, that was rad. What's up, guys? Hey, what's up? There's a there's a javelina deer fight going on. Yeah, pack of javelina chasing deer. Kind of cool. This ran like right in front of us. The javelina ran, ran off that way. Did y'all see? So we're climbing up the uh, lime kiln trail, which we've been on, I think since like Cottonwood. You can see the sun starting to set in the background here in Sedona. I thought we'd, uh, was hoping we'd get to see some red rock up close before the sun goes down. I'm not sure if that'll happen or not, but uh, definitely feeling stronger than I was before at aid station. Harley, what'd you find over there? Snake. Snake. Uh, anyway, it's gonna be getting dark here soon. So we'll get our lights out, get some warmer clothes on, and keep pushing until the Sedona aid station. Oh, dude, perfect timing. Heck yeah. Oh yeah? I think so. My battery's almost dead, so I don't know if it caught that, but really pretty view here. And now we're gonna keep climbing. Thursday morning here, Cocodona 250. Still got Harley pacing me. We're making our way out of Sedona up to Schnebley Hill. Uh, I got into Sedona Aid Station, what, like 11 o'clock? Yeah, 10.30, 10.30. Slept there, slept a long time there. Um, like five or six hours. And I had to get my ankle looked at by the medic there because it's not good, but we're pushing through it. He taped me up and I've got the bandage tape and the compression on it and it's manageable. So we're gonna be going slow the rest of the way, but I think uh, we can push through it. Got a big climb to get the Schnebly, about 3,800 feet over the next 16 miles or so. Um, but once we get onto the Coconino Plateau, the terrain won't be nearly as rocky as it is here in Sedona, which is gonna help because the rocky descents are what's killing my foot right now, my left ankle. Everything else is okay. My blisters hurt, but they're fine. My legs feel fresh, all things considering. I'm just dealing with this stupid swollen ankle right now, the same one I hurt like a year and a half ago on my canyon run. But, Spirits are high. I'm um, gonna have a good push today, trying to get uh, to Munns Park sometime around sunset. And then once we're up there, it's kinda 
start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So we're getting there, one foot in front of the other. So you can see the Midgley Bridge off in the distance to the right. This mountain right here is Wilson Mountain. So there's a lot of great trails around here. I think the trail we're going down is Casner Canyon. I could be wrong. But we're gonna pop out at the bottom of this by Midgley Bridge. And that's where we're gonna cross into Oak Creek. But I've run up and down Wilson like, I don't know, a handful of times. It's a great trail up there. It's a good climb to get to the top and then it's really pretty. Um, but yeah, there's the bridge we're going under. And I'll check back in when we're doing the creek crossing. I'm just getting a video of the drone, getting a video of us doing this race. Say hi to the live stream. What's that? Hawks out there in the back here. Oh yeah, it's rad. It's so cool. So we're at a pretty neat section of the course here. Uh, hop down Grasshopper Point uh, onto the Allen Bend Trail, I think it's called. And we're in this really cool oasis-like area. Here's Oak Creek. It's gonna be our crossing. Looks like they've got a rope out there for us. And we've been trying to figure out if we wanna take our shoes off, which we're probably gonna do because there isn't uh, crew access for another 20 miles or so, 23 miles, which is a long way to go. But it's beautiful down here and we're about to cross the creek and then Climb up, uh, up the Schnebly. His ankles are so long. Hopefully that cold water after this out. Put a little tension in it. He's going to give you a little tension on the rope. Very end. <laughs> it's a party down here at Oak Creek. People bathing, people crossing. 
Nice place to take a breather before the big climb coming up. We successfully crossed by staying dry. Somehow. But there's a rope to help us across. I don't know if you can see it, but it's pretty loose and water is about knee deep. But may not safely. Now we're gonna climb. We're still making our way up this mountain. The climb is super gnarly, but just opened up a little bit and this is our view behind us. It's pretty awesome, but I think uh, we're both ready for this climb to be over. Amen. Just a quick update here. We're a little under 170 miles, maybe like 167 or 168 or so. I'm not sure exactly because the mileage on my watch got screwed up, like I explained earlier. 77 and a half hours in, which is crazy to say. We're up in Flagstaff. We left the uh, Schnabel Hill aid station a little bit ago. We're on our way to Munns Park. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. We have to get to Munns Park by 1 a.m. And then there's a 16 mile out and back, so eight out, eight back. And we have to finish that by 6 a.m. So we're gonna push through the night to make sure we hit that second cutoff at Munns. And then from there, as long as we hit that, we'll be able to do like 30 minute miles the rest of the way. Uh, and we, we'll be fine as far as finishing. But we've been powering through. We're doing like 20 minute pace right now. So I think we'll be good as long as we hit that second cutoff, getting back into Munns. Um, and then after that, this guy will be done. I'll be picking up a second pacer to take me to Walnut Canyon. And then Emily, my girlfriend, is pacing me Walnut Canyon to the finish, which is gonna be really cool. So, that's about it. Harley, what do you wanna to say to the people? I feel like absolute garbage right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm still feeling good though. For oh yes. Speaking of absolute garbage, yeah. my ankle is horrible. Uh, basically feels like I'm being stabbed in my foot every time I step on it. Uh, but other than that, I'm great. It's been a really cool experience. It has been. I'm really happy I got to do it. So you're going to be out here next year, right? 100%. And I'll either be pacing him or doing it again. Or I might just quit running altogether after this. Because <laughs> how much pain I'm in right now. We'll see what happens. But either way, that's it. It's really pretty up here. Being in the pine trees, the sky is really blue. A lot of birds tripping and nature things happening. So it's nice to have the cooler temperatures up here in Flagstaff. And we're gonna keep moving and we'll check in when we get to Munns. All right, so it's about 7.49 p.m. Just starting to get dark here. We just started the out and back section of Munns Park. It's like 15.5 miles back to the same age station that we left. Um, had some Wendy's Baconators, it was awesome. Got uh, my feet taken care of a little bit more. So now we're gonna march on into the night here. The cutoff to leave Munns Park after this is 6 a.m. So we're doing pretty good on time. We should hopefully be back by about three. <clears throat> and then this guy what up? is going to move on to bigger and better things. I'm going to pick up my second pacer. But he's going to be at like 96 miles, I think, or something like that. So we've been talking about if he should just call it or, you know, just go run four, whatever it takes to get him to 100. Yeah, I'd rather continue. I think he should do that because hitting 100 miles is awesome. Yep, I agree. <clears throat> So we're going to fight our way into the night here. So a bit of an update. It's now Friday morning about 6.30. We've been moving for about two and a half hours now. Uh, Harley and I got back into uh, um, whatever the last aid station was. Can't think of the name of it. We got back in and around two 
Uh, I got settled in and I slept till about 3.30. So I got about an hour of sleep. Uh, and then got up, had some food. Uh, and got ready and headed out on round four. Harley uh, is done pacing. He finished with me at like 97.1 miles or something. So he went on and uh, ran three miles on his own to get to 100 for his first 100 mile distance. So super cool of him. I picked up uh, my second pacer, my friend Jasmine, who's a little bit behind me, but um, so yeah, we're making our way to the Kelly Canyon aid station. Enjoying a beautiful morning here in Flagstaff. It was a really cool uh, pine tree section we were going through with some really nice single track and a beautiful sunrise. Uh, we're kind of climbing up out of that a little bit now. So to our left up here, you can kind of see Sedona. Looks like the top of Kazner where we were, but I'm not positive on that. But the sun's coming up that way. Uh, my ankle still feels horrible, but everything else feels okay. So, um, just gonna be another day of getting slow, easy miles in until we're at the finish line, which should be either really early Saturday morning. It's probably gonna be Saturday around sunrise, I'm hoping. Um, we're at like 198 or so miles right now, so pretty soon we'll be hitting the 200 mark, so that's exciting. And then it's just, uh, just forward progress until the next aid station and we'll keep that going the rest of the way. <laughs> so, quick update here. We're 15 miles into the segment. Got about three miles to go to the aid station. Been cranking away anywhere from like 20 to 24 minute miles. Um, so I'm with Jasmine who relieved Harley of his duties after Harley went through the night, went through two nights and did a hundred miles with me. Uh, and Jasmine, why don't you tell the people about how good you are at crossing creeks at the bottom of a Grand Canyon? Because the story's great. <laughs> it is uh, my particular forte actually, crossing creeks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so I was going to Ribbon Falls and the bridge is washed out. And so the first time I crossed that creek, I tossed my shoes across and did okay. As I was coming back from Ribbon Falls, I tried to hold my shoes and cross, had trekking poles in the other hand, and managed to drop a shoe in the middle of the creek at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so the shoes started flowing away, and my first thought was, do I have a backup for that? I have a backup for everything. I don't have a backup for my tennis shoes. And so I <laughs> kept trying to catch the shoe with my trekking pole, and I like ran a little bit down the creek, tried to catch it again, didn't work. And so then it really took off, it caught the current, it was gone. And so I ran probably a quarter mile down the side of the creek with one shoe on and one shoe off, trying to find my other shoe and couldn't find it. And I just realized my shoe was gone. And so I saw these girls and they were like, what are you gonna do? And I said, I guess I'm gonna have to just run in my bare feet because how else am I gonna get back to my car? And so the one was like, well, I have some spare socks if you want. And another one said, I have some, I think it was like medical tape or something. And so at first I was like, nah, I'm good. But I started running and I put, I had a backup pair of socks. So I put two layers of socks on each foot and like probably three miles into it, I'd run through the first pair of socks and it really hurt. And by this time people were like, taking pictures of me <laughs> when they saw me this one girl I like looked back she had passed me and I just happened to look back and she's like taking pictures of me from behind and so um about I want to say a mile out of Phantom Ranch these girls that I had seen before they were also running down there and so they were like hey if you want the socks we'll give them to you so they gave me the socks they gave me the medical tape and then 
uh, one of them was like, you should ask the forest rangers at Phantom Ranch if they have any shoes. And I was like, they probably don't have shoes, but maybe they have like duct tape. And so I hobble up to the little lemonade stand at Phantom Ranch and I say, do you have any duct tape or socks or shoes for sale? And the lady was so nice. She actually like looked around like she was trying to look for this product. <laughs> and she goes, no. And I said, well, I uh, lost my shoe in the river and I got to get out of here. And she goes, you lost your shoe at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I was like, yeah. And she just looks at me and she goes, hold on. And so she comes out and she's like, we have a shoe graveyard. And she walks me around to the back to this other little building and they have all these shoes that people have left at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And so she goes, what size are you? And I was like, I don't care. Like if the shoe can go on my foot, I will take it. And so she actually pulls out this pair of shoes that fits me perfect. It's like women's tennis shoes. Um, it was one size bigger, but it actually fit my feet. Like they're probably a little swollen from the running. And uh, I like put the shoes on and I was like all teary by this point. And I was like, thank you so much. I love you. You're my hero like five times. <laughs> And then I hadn't put on the extra pair of socks yet because I was only like a mile outside of Phantom Ranch when they gave it to me. So I went to go fill up my pack and those girls were there and I was like, guys, I got shoes. And they were like all cheering at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And then I gave them all their stuff back because I hadn't used it. And then I was just like, all right. I thought that uphill hike out of here was going to be the hardest part. But after that, like the uphill was not a part issue at all. Like anything was okay as long as I had shoes on. So, that's it. So, lesson to be learned is if you're crossing a creek that has a heavy current at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, hang on to your shoes. Anything else to add? Uh, no, this ends Jasmine's podcast. <laughs> yeah, we'll check back later with more <laughs> funny Jasmine stories. <laughs> oh, yeah. Quick update here where my watch says 222, so we're probably at 212 miles or like a mile and a half outside of the uh, Fort Todd Hill Aid Station. Uh, and I haven't really filmed a lot today because it's kind of been a struggle just to push through these last miles. It's all pretty here, but it's kind of monotonous. It's kind of been the same thing for the last little bit, and I'm ready for it to be done. But well, we got Fort Todd Hill and then Walnut Canyon. And then Jasmine will be done. And then I'll pick up Emily, my girlfriend, for Walnut Canyon to the finish. So it's kind of been about fighting cutoffs for the last little bit. So we have to leave Walnut Canyon by 7.30 and we have to leave... Um, what's the day station after that? Um, Fort Todd Hill. Oh, we have to leave Fort Tuttle by 7.30 and then Walnut Canyon by 1 a.m. Which we're still, we still have like a two hour buffer. So I think we're in good shape, but it's still kind of freaky to have been out here for over a hundred hours an hour and be within an hour of missing cutoff. But as long as we keep this pace up, we'll be fine. Um, ankle feels terrible. Feet hurt. Uh, other than that, I'm okay. Trying to keep spirits up. Nice to have a pacer out here to distract me with their crazy stories. <laughs> um, but, and random nursing trivia, that's right. Hey, tell, tell the people how, what makes the sound of a heartbeat. <laughs> um, so it's the valves between the upper chambers of the heart and the lower chambers of the heart closing. So when the heart beats, it's squeezing the blood out to the body and you don't want that blood washing back up into the upper chambers. So what happens is the valves between the two chambers slam shut, then the heart squeezes. And so those valves prevent the backwash, but they also make the sound of your heartbeat. Jason gets to hear this for there, 40 miles. There you have it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to distract from everything else I'm feeling right now, it's perfect. So. Anyway, we're almost to Fort Todd Hill, so we will check in after that. So one final update here from Friday. It's about quarter to seven, the sun's kind of setting. Uh, we're gonna be running out of daylight soon, but we're just making our final push into 
Kelly Canyon. I took a 10 minute drone up a little bit back there and been able to push pretty hard since then. So my third trail nap of the day. So three 10 minute trail naps and after all three, I felt pretty good. So it's definitely been working for me. You can see the sun setting behind the trees. We should be set to arrive at the, LA, at the Kelly Canyon aid station, probably around 11, maybe 11.30, but should be well within the 1 a.m. cutoff. So we'll have a good push through the night and still looking at a Saturday morning finish. We have till noon, so um, not sure what that'll look like, but feel pretty good about hitting this final checkpoint and then pushing on to the end. So Jasmine's gonna be leaving us at the Kelly Canyon Aid Station. I'm gonna pick up Emily, my girlfriend, to pace me the last 20 miles or so. So Jasmine, do you have any parting words for the camera? All right, there you have it. So we're about halfway up the Eldon climb I'm here with my girlfriend, Emily. She helped me get through the night last night when I was pretty much delirious the whole night. Tell the people how bad I was last night. He was really bad. I think he I was took... was wandering and thought he saw people, but there were stoplights <laughs> and rocks, and they weren't. I think I took five or six trail naps. It was like every 45 minutes I had to lay down and take a 15 minute nap. But we're about halfway up this climb, maybe a little bit more. The sun rises out and it's beautiful. Uh, it's 5.18, so we have six hours and 42 minutes to get to the finish line. And the light's finally starting to appear at the end of the tunnel. Finally finished that brutal climb up Elden. Probably the toughest climb I've ever had to do in my life. But now we're on this ridge line on our way to the aid station. It's really beautiful. And then eight mile downhill to the finish. So we're on the descent on the backside of Eldon, pretty much blew in and out of the aid station because uh, I'm ready to be done and she's ready to be done. We're getting some great views of the San Francisco peaks. There's a little bit of snow left on top of Humphreys. The ski resort is on the other side of the mountain on the left. Well, the mountain on the left is Humphreys, the one in the middle is Agassiz, and there's Fremont. Those make up the San Francisco peaks. It's the tallest peak in Arizona at 12,633 feet. It was a volcano that blew its top. It used to be closer to 16,000 feet. 
And now all the volcanic rock is all over the area. It's pretty cool. And we'll be on this dirt road for a while. We'll be on some single track. Then we're gonna go through Buffalo Park and then through some of the streets that lead into Heritage Square. And we'll be done. And I never have to think about this race ever again. So we just made our way into Buffalo Park. Doing the last little loop here before we get into town. It's 9.08, so we're about three hours below the cutoff right now. Probably looking at finishing in, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, half hour. So that's pretty awesome. Can't wait to be done. I'm not going to do the GoPro for my finish because I'll just rip it from the YouTube live stream. So this will be it for me. So if you watch this whole thing, thanks for watching. And I won't see you next year during this race because I'm never doing this again. Nice. So we're on the jam cam here. Right here. Approaching Coming the finish in. line for Coca Dona. So I'm get, getting a video of Jamil getting a video. <laughs> Had to do it. Jamil's the man. I've run several of his races and can't say enough about Air Viper. If you ever get a chance to run this race, you're gonna hate your life for four days or five days or however long it takes, but right about now, it'll all be worth it. 100%. <laughs> Do you have a runner on the jam cam? Here, coming in. Coming in for the finish. So close. They're videoing each other. Love it. Hundred percent. The best thing is they can't curse Jamil because he went out and did the work last year. <laughs> and this is sorry, we weren't on your we didn't have your audio on. This is Nicholas Norwood, Jamil. Live. Yeah. Oh. If you want to, it's up to you. You got a few more blocks to go. Yeah, go for it. Uh that light down there, that light, you have a left and then it's like a block and a half. Got Jason Baum here. Yep, Jason two, Baum. Three, sorry. One. Yeah, his uh, he was a bit further back because his uh, thing, his tracker hadn't pinged for 51 oh. minutes. So, huge shout out to the cheer squad here. Jason Baum is just a few blocks away. From the left hand turn onto Birch. Jason, two thirty one. Another Prescott Valley resident decided to leave his house on Monday morning and traverse by foot up into the heart of northern Arizona, the heart of Flagstaff, to Heritage Square. I wonder if he thought as a Prescott Valley resident, uh, you know, that just someday that he would be partaking in a in a in a run to Flagstaff. <laughs> Yep, straight, straight, straight. Still alive? Uh, yeah. You're on air yeah. still, yeah. yeah we're we're going to follow him all the way to the finish. He does, here. if you want it. Hold on. Hold on, here you go. Shout out to my amazing girlfriend, Emily, for pacing me from Walnut Canyon to the finish. The furthest she's ever ran before this is eight miles. So she just did 21, including a massive climb up and down out of the gym. Wow. So. That's awesome. <laughs> Maybe more ready than him. <laughs> well, next year, he, uh, Jason has to return the favor and pace her when she runs the Coconut 250. How fast can Jason solve a Rubik's Cube? I feel that there's an inside thing there.
probably in the time that it takes him to probably faster than uh, than running 250 miles across the state of Arizona. There you can see it. Apparently, Jason is known for making some fantastic YouTube videos about the Grand Canyon as well. Might have to check some of that stuff out. He is going to be taking the left hand on left hand turn on Birch here in just a matter of seconds. That will leave him about two blocks away from the finish line of the Cocodona 250. Oh, and hold on one second. We got to go to the Wardia cam here. We got a Go Jason sign at the finish line. Fantastic. They are ready for Jason to make it to the finish here in Heritage Square. And he has made the iconic left turn onto Birch Street. He so is close. Going to pass over uh, the intersection at LaRue. Past the rock wall, then take a hard right into Coconut Alley. Uh, Jason Burgess, we're discovering a man of many talents, a filmmaker, a an expert Rubik's Cube solver, and uh, within a few moments, a finisher of the Cocodona 250. Valley's own Jason Baum coming to the finish line of the Cocodona 250. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, being paced by his girlfriend who had never run longer than eight miles, she took him 21 in from Walnut Canyon. There he is. There you see. The go Jason go sign, the hugs, all the feels. What an amazing job by Jason. So yeah, the tracker is now confirming that Stephen Park has left uh, Elden Aid, and he has two hours and eight minutes to make it down from Mount Elden into Heritage Square to complete the Cocodona 250. The energy and the vibes are high at Heritage Square. Uh, somebody's asking how many runners there are left in the <laughs> race yet to finish. I believe there's about 15 or 16. I am not 100% sure, but yeah, it looks like it's about 15. That's my wonderful mother in the chat. Asking ah. how many runners are left. Hello, Matt's mom. Jason, going to enjoy the refreshing spring water, or the refreshing mountain water of liquid a can death. of liquid death at the finish line. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. It looks like Dave Duran... Nicholas Norwood and Christine Kitzler should all be making their way on to Beaver Street and down to Heritage Square. David Duran is a very loquacious individual as well. I wouldn't be surprised to uh, 
uh, see him with some thoughts as he is heading down Beaver Street. So we might have to tune in and see if he's got the uh, the energy and the willingness to share. Well, I believe we've got. Oh, we have him. Sorry about that. We have. Uh... Well, we've reached the end of the journey. Um, the end of the Kokodona 250. It's quite the race. Uh, a lot happened out there over five days. A lot of it's still a blur to me, in spite of me trying to document everything and you know get as much footage as I, as I could. There's just so much that happens out there, and there's sections of the race like that I literally just don't remember stuff happening. Like uh, one in particular that comes to mind is like I don't remember anything from like Munns Park to Kelly Canyon. Like that whole section just doesn't exist in my mind. Um, so it's just it's crazy how much happens out there during a multi-day race like this. But so many good memories that I had out there and just such a great experience. Um, you know, I said a few times in the video about, you know, how miserable I was and how much pain I was in and everything. And I was never going to do it again. And that's all part of it. Um, you know, so we're a couple of weeks removed from the race now. And yeah, I'm kind of thinking about next year already. I don't know if it'll happen or not, but I'd do it again 100% if I had the opportunity to. And if any of you out there are thinking about doing this race or have any, any interest in doing this race, just do it. Um, you know, the distance is a lot. So I wouldn't say don't let it scare you because you have to respect a distance like 250 miles. But um, I would say, you know, if you've got some ultras under your belt, especially some 100 milers, and you want to jump into a 200 plus mile race, this is a great one to do it. Aravipa does a phenomenal job of putting on their events. And this race was just top notch. Um, just from the people, from the coverage, from the family atmosphere, to the aid station food, um, which was great this year. I understand that maybe in the inaugural year it wasn't, it wasn't so great, but whatever was wrong, they fixed it because the aid station food was great. And we had everything from burgers to pizza to lasagna to spaghetti and meatballs to bacon, sausage, pancakes, you name it, um, ribs. You know, so they did a really good job taking care of us at the eight stations and uh, just so many good memories I had out there and a lot that I'm going to cherish for a long, long time. So I hope you found the video interesting. I tried to make it long because it's a long race, but not excessively long. So um, I'd like to think I did that. This is my longest video yet, but it's also my longest race yet. So it, it is kind of fitting. Um, but if you watched it all the way through, I thank you. I really do appreciate it. Um, hope you enjoyed it and hope you found it insightful and maybe inspired you to take on this beast of a race for yourself. Um, one thing that I learned coming into this race is like it really does take a village to do something like this. And I know there's guys that do 200 solo, but I couldn't imagine doing an effort like that solo. Um, I would not have finished without my crew and without my pacers and without all the support I had from my friends and family. So... That's one thing that I really took away from it. So to my Pacers, you know, Harley and Jasmine, you know, and Emily, um, just can't thank you guys enough for stepping up and, and pushing me through to the end. Um, you know, to my mom for flying out uh, for the week from Pennsylvania to cheer me on and, and play the role of crew for this race. You know, can't thank her enough for everything that she did. And I mean, Emily was just a superstar all weekend just from crewing to pacing to everything she did leading up to the race to help me get to that point. Um, I mean, she was amazing all week and I wouldn't have finished up without her. So just wanted to thank all of you guys for helping me get to the finish line uh, successfully. So I think that's about it. If you guys have any you know questions or comments about the race, you know, feel free to hit me up in the comments section or shoot me an email or whatever. Or find me on Facebook and Strava. You know, I'd love to to answer some of your questions about this race and hopefully uh, get you inspired to get out there because I think you know this is kind of like this is quickly becoming the the premier trail running event in the country. Um, and I think you know I just want other people to experience it to have the same experience that I had because it was amazing. And uh, you know, you you suffer. You know, you go through highs and lows. You're sleep deprived, you're miserable, but somehow it's just incredible at the end and you can't really put it into words. And so now it's like, I feel part of this family, this Cocodona family that, it, that, that's gone through it. You know, we went, we went through something special and it was hard and, you know, we came out of the other side and we did it and, uh, it's, it's really cool. So, um, 
yeah, so I'm kind of rambling, so I'm going to wrap this up, uh, probably just with a little montage here of some pictures from the race, so we'll get rolling with that. But again, if you watch this video, thank you. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I'm actually not signed up for another race here for a long time, so it's kind of weird. So this might be my last video for a little while, um, but I don't know, we'll see. I'm still kind of in recovery mode, um, but... Yeah, so I'm not sure what my next adventure will be, but um, I'm sure it'll be something, and um, whenever that happens, I'll be sure to film it. So, again, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.